call for everybody on our call. Thank you so much, our Zoom call. And uh, it's just a Q&A and get feedback from everybody about issues they're dealing with or comments they want to make or uh, we ways we can support them or um, any other feedback uh, questions. One thing we put on the web page today, if anybody's interested in, is why so many um, gifted male students get identified as ODD, Oppositional Defiant Disorder. And um, one of the things I did is it came from a question in a workshop about why are we identifying so many boys as ODD. Uh, and if you go on what I have in this article, if you go on Wikipedia, you can see the characteristics for ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, are exactly, almost exactly the same as uh, negative characteristics of gifted males. Wow. And they are almost identical, and we don't identify them. So that's on uh, the blog today about how you begin to look at that. Uh, but it's, it's fascinating the number of boys we're identifying that way, not girls, but boys. And they are the the uh, disproportionality of, of uh, dropouts. Uh, you're twice as likely to drop out as if you're gifted if you're not. So that's kind of that piece. It's on the uh, freebie today. Um, but other Vern, I know you're still working with kids, right? Absolutely. What are you running into? Well, so my job has evolved. Um, I've become more administration than I've ever been. So my focus has been how do we empower others to work with students using the learning the way we have, right? Um, in that process, it's led to our, our movement of what was an alternative program struggling to on-site at Indian Hills Community College, which has been powerful, and then of course we got shut down. Um, our, my biggest concern right now is in Iowa, they're giving us the option to require kids to take uh, online learning during this time or to do it voluntarily. Few schools are in a position to do online learning effectively, even with those students who have all the resources. And so we're focusing on we're going to choose to go the route of voluntary, but focusing in, sorry, focusing with students who are trying to recover credits during this time, which a big chunk are our under-resourced students. And so the plan we're working on is how can we use this as a way to better connect our under-resourced students to the virtual world so that we can stay connected to them. Does that make sense? That's a great idea. A lot of hurdles, um, but there's a lot of it, you guys, and I've learned this from so many of you, and the hurdles are the real, real seeds of ideas outside the box. And right now, there's so many companies offering free internet services to those that don't have it. We have people willing, I think, as I go to the community, to help purchase devices for students who don't have devices. Um, right now, we're still, we're closed in Iowa through the 13th, but we expect beyond like everybody else. And we're paying all our staff, including our associates, which are frontline for us. And my thought is that our associates become like special ops in virtual reality. You know, how do we, do we have to honk outside a kid's door to understand the opportunities out there? We call, we use social media, but let's use our associates as our connectors since they're often more connected to our students than our teachers are. So I see several people have joined us. What other comments, questions do people have? Suggestions for Vern? That's interesting you're sitting outside their door honking. <laughs> Whatever it takes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, um, can you hear me? Ruben? Hey, <laughs> how you doing? I was thinking that uh, schools, I think, are going to be at a total loss as to how to start school again and how to start, you know, not just the relationship building, but the data gathering. Who never got on internet? Who did? Who had homeschooling? Who watched television? Who was traumatized? You know, I think you know, there may be a need for us to approach the 
how to even begin school when we all come back so that the first week or two is more about, you know, getting the effective filter down, getting some of the information that the administration needs in order to divide everybody into categories to better address whatever we need to do, and just a different kind of triage. That's it. That's interesting. I think that's a reality. And one, one of the things we, I was talking about with Michelle before we started is they're going to come back. One of the things you can be sure of is that all the kids are going to come back on structure. The idea of, of following a structure is gone. And, and like Michelle said, they'll be have gone six months. So it's six, it's not just summer, two and a half months. It's six months of instruction. We know that domestic violence goes up during times like this. And we know that you're going to have more, you have more violence when there's not enough money and when there's high conflict. And if you've got 14 people in a small place, you've got both of those. And I'm, um, so I think we're going to come back with a whole nother level of trauma we haven't seen before um, because of that. Um, what, what's the thinking of some of the rest of you, or what qu comments do you have to make about that? Hi, everybody. I, I'm not sure if my camera's working or not. I just turned it on. Um, this is Mich another Michelle. Oh, wait, there we go. Uh, I guess uh, I guess I have to go into my settings to allow the camera. So you, can you can verbally hear me, though, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I just kind of logged. I kind of logged in at the last minute on my phone. Um, I am a high school English teacher out in White River on the Apache Reservation, and I'm a first year teacher at the high school. But I taught college English for 20 years, uh, with 10 of those years being online. So this whole transitioning to online is not difficult for me. But what was difficult and now you're kind of freaking me out, <laughs> is, the, is the whole, um, we, we had adopted, that she gave us your research, the research-based strategies book about yeah. narrowing the gap with under-resourced, and um, we were having to incorporate strategies, and I was really starting to do really well and building a rapport with my kids, and I was just really, really happy. And then this whole thing happened. And now I haven't heard from but maybe four or five of my 150 kids. I'm supposed to be calling. We just shut, we were on spring break for the first week of all this. And then last week, we just kind of just basically shut down. And then, you know, and now the, the, the state of Arizona just uh, shut us down for till the end of April. So I'm, I'm just out here flailing around with the rest of everybody trying to figure out, you know, I don't know who's going to have internet, who isn't, who's, who's doing the work I'm designing and who isn't and trying to narrow 15, 20 pages of online work down to two or three pages for packets. And yeah, so <laughs> I don't really know what to say, except you guys are the first human faces I've seen in quite some time. So hi. <laughs> <laughs> So we're going to do this every week, okay? I saw that. I saw that. And yeah. I'm going to change my camera here real quick. Yeah. So go ahead. Uh, Michelle, thank you. Michelle, if you just pull your screen down, at the bottom of the screen, there's a camera icon, a video icon. Yeah, no, it's, I have to go into settings and allow okay, cool, cool. Zoom to access my camera. If I, I Michelle, could I give you a couple ideas and then see if other people have ideas? Certainly, please. And we yes. have a chat question as and well. I'm, yeah, I'm freaking out about calling all these parents, most of whom I've not even spoken with yet. So, do you have do you have cell numbers of your students? Uh, Michelle. Okay. Did I lose you? Okay. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Ruby. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're, I'm we're recording, so she'll be able to go back and hear. Yeah. I'm, back. I'm back. There you are. It bumped me out. So hi. <laughs> hi. Do you have cell numbers for your students? Um, I, I, no, I don't have anything yet. So I'm kind of designing a form, and I'm going to just call whatever numbers are in our database. And I know I have. They all have their. I did a lot of. I okay. Let me start over. We do use Google Classroom. 
And since I taught online, I was, and we, I have my own computers in my classroom. So I've really been pushing that and we've been using it a lot in the classroom, but most of them haven't been using it at home. I was pushing for them to start using it on their cell phones, but of course their cell phones are their personal devices. But now in this crisis, um, I think some of them are telling me, I've had about six be online so far, and they're saying that so they can get out of doing chores and housework, they're doing their schoolwork and they're logging in. <laughs> I, well, one thing I would say is that if you can get a hold of them, ask them, see, because if they're in high poverty, they're buying phones that have limited minutes on them. Right. So they don't have a plan. So they just have minutes. Okay. Right. Yeah. So part of the reason is they're being very careful how they use those minutes because they, they only, they don't buy plans. They buy X number of minutes. Right. So if right. they're in survival and they're kind of treating, keeping track of their relatives and family and friends, they're very limited. So one thing to ask them, if you can get cell phone numbers, is ask them if they will check in with you every day with like, okay, I'm okay today. Like you oh, want okay. to just ask them to check in every day and let them, you know, they're okay. Or they let you know they're okay. That's a and good, then, that's a good suggestion. And I do have a Google voice phone number they can call and I'm actually making an assignment for next week. We have to do our lesson plans and um, where they have to, the ones who have only a packet have to fill out this form of how I can contact them. And the ones who are online are going to let me know how to contact them. So. And one of the things is I would also say to you, when you give assignments, I would make a step sheet. Here are the four things I need from you this week. And I okay, I'm doing an agenda kind of like that, yeah. but uh, like Monday, we're doing this, Tuesday, do this. Is that what you mean? Kind of, yeah. No, what I mean is yeah. at the end, you say at the end of this week, I need these four things from you. Right, Here. yes, I have, yes, I have that. Yeah. On, on Friday, on the agenda on Friday, I say, so today you must turn in this, 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 and this. Yeah, I would yeah. have more than four things if I can help it simply because um, they're overwhelmed right now. Right, right. Other thing I try and find out mm -hmm. is if they have food and I try and find out because they're, they're on the reservation, their transportation is going to be limited. Well, we have we, the school district. We have we were they're giving kids food. They're give they're giving food, um, but they have to get there. So just yesterday or Monday, they incorporated more areas in the district where they're going to be taking the food to. And so the kids are picking up their breakfast and their lunch in the mornings along. And then on Monday and Tuesday, they pick up their work packets for the week. So, yeah. Okay. One thing I would ask about a food is this reason. <laughs> they're sharing that food with adults in the household. Right. So the question okay. is... Are they getting enough food? Are they even getting any food? Okay. Uh, I'd be wanting to know that. Yeah. But I, I would recommend, anybody else have uh, suggestions? I guess Vern works with high school kids as well. Vern, I don't know where you went, but do you have suggestions or ideas? Well, I lost you all for a while, so I had to log back on, so I missed a lot of Michelle's discussion. She's still with high school kids on a Native American Indian reservation. Out of 150 high school kids, she's heard from about three. Uh, about well, six, I, yeah. Six, sorry. That's so okay. Initially, everything we, and Atoma is a high poverty area where we moved to, and we're struggling to get, we've been offering enrichment, which the state has been recommending. We're struggling to get participation. Now that the state okayed yesterday, actually, our ability to work on recovering credits, my focus with my team right now is going to be trying to figure out which students we know a great majority of them don't have internet or devices, and we're going to partner with people in the community to get them internet and devices, and then we're going to utilize a team to try to seek them out and make them get in contact with us. And at that point, we hope to establish a regular contact period um, with each of our students, knowing that'll be a struggle, but 
I think the key is- I, You know, my district is still, they're still really, we're just flailing around. We're still trying to figure it out. We're, we're all good with the online Google Classroom thing because that's been the push for the whole year, but um, I, we don't even know. I was told that we're going to just go based off of the grades they had the, at the end of last quarter. Right. And then focus, I'm supposed to focus my phone calls on the students who are failing, who could reach a passing grade. I'm teaching 10th grade. So, um, yeah. So that, I mean, yeah. I'd like to give you one more idea too. Sure. Thanks. If you can subgroup your kids into groups of four, okay, and say to them, I need you to be a team and one of you is going to be the leader, one of you is going to be the encourager, one of you is going to be the um, uh, uh, recorder. Recorder. And one recorder. Of you yeah, I used to do this. I do that in the class all the time, like with right. books and novels. And, right. Yeah. But tell them whoever the leader is has to report in with you uh, once, a, once a week on their group. So one of the things you're building social capital within your class outside of them, and it's the leader's responsibility to make sure each of the people in their group are okay that week. And then every week you move the leader around. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that would be, and this, is, this is of course, once I've reached out and found exactly. out who's participating, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it would be a way for them to build social capital too. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's a great idea. And help them feel like they're a part. Most of, I, I posted a discussion and most of the ones who are responding, uh, it was a discussion about the coronavirus. It was a New York Times article. And then they have uh, discussion questions at the end and I'm just having the kids respond to that. And they're they're really interacting well. We just had the, the close till the end of the school year uh, notice on Monday. So just yesterday, kids who weren't logging in are logging in now because they're like, okay, I got to do this. They thought they were going to go back to school in two weeks, and now they're not. So There's been some articles in the um, various publications about how school districts are now parking their buses in pre-assigned locations near, for example, Section 8 housings and using that as a Wi-Fi hotspot. Wow, that's interesting. Hmm. And so make sure there was, there's been articles in, there in Brookings and I believe also AEI have, have run these. Look up, just Google it, you'll come across it. Talk to your superintendents. Um, the advantage is, is that the school bus has the power source, you know, it, it can run this. Uh, it's mobile and it can go for three hours in a variety of different locations in one day. Um, and um, just you know it just it, it you, you send out words so the students know when the bus will be at the parking lot in an, in an area high concentration area work it, it'd be harder to work at a at a reservation obviously yeah it's a very huge reservation it spans hundreds of miles i mean but, it, uh, and they the kids get bussed in they spend an hour on the bus every day to get to school it's crazy but, but there's probably still some, maybe a few central locations within the res that they can, you know, uh, they can get their parents to take them or that, you know, more of a higher concentration and just, just once a week or so. So in the, that type of situation, so they can get some access to some internet. At least and at least on. maybe be able to download PDFs or something like that to their exactly. phones or something. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's a good idea. You'd have yeah, to watch for social distancing. What's that? You would have to watch for social media. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I don't know quite. Yeah, and but like you said, though, Jean, you said you do it in a Section 8 housing. So if the bus is there, then all the houses in the area, they could probably log in. But uh, in this case, I don't, yeah, I don't really know. It's, it's such a huge, huge area here in Arizona. It's, um, yeah. One of the questions that was in the chat box is, what are some practical ways to encourage structure for students at home? And let me just say a couple things about that. I think a lot of parents went in with a very rigid idea of structure and that is that doesn't work. So one of the things, like we got an uh, email or a picture yesterday from 
uh, T's grandson, okay? He's 12 years old. He was studying at his desk, sitting with his computer. His five-year-old brother was on top of his shoulders, banging him on the head. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? That's going to be how it is in a lot of households. So the first thing about structure is not to make it so strict, uh, but just say sometime during today, we're going to have an hour of this, an hour of that, and then we're going to have physical activity. And one of the articles I wrote is that I really recommend that they do have 45 minutes of cooking every day because it's a way that kids can be involved. You can do a lot of math and reading in that. And But I think I read this morning online that one, one family every day at noon, this junior high kid and all his friends get on video uh, Zoom and they dance together. Okay, so they have this virtual dancing that goes on for 45 minutes But you'll have to work in some sort of physical activity. So I recommend a flexible uh, Schedule which you have certain amounts of time to do but it varies from day to day depending on what's happening uh, Some people can make a schedule work for a couple hours in the morning but the idea that you're going to have a rigid schedule like school, uh, most households, it's not going to happen at all. Um, also, this is Regina. Hey, how is everybody doing? Hi. Um, hi. Uh, I just sent a link through the chat. Um, I got some really good um, information, and this particular one really addresses um, how to make a new routine while school is closed. And so you can use that particular link that would possibly help. And then um, because I'm in the college setting, there is other um, things you know, that I send out for college level students. However, um, for yourself, there are virtual field trips that um, people can attend to, everything from Niagara Falls webcam to the International Space Station, um, virtual zoos and aquariums tours, uh, yeah, Broadway me the shows and concerts, Society. virtual museums, live webinar, I mean, um, webcam feeds. So there are so many things that are out there uh, that can be done. And then Michelle, to your point, uh, when you start thinking about, you know, how do I reach all of these uh, scholars, all of these young scholars, getting on the phone and calling them, a lot of most of the people have a phone. They may not have internet yeah. access, but you can actually hold some classes through that, or even they can call into Zoom oh, yeah. with their phone. And so then more people have that kind of access as well. Right. Just some suggestions. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. So my question uh, to you is, you have a great tip, so can you please share your uh, process? You can't hear me, Ruth? Through uh, some social media, you know, like some tips to survive this or to thrive in this environment. Um, some of the links that have been, we've been talking about, some of the things that Ruby said about the structure. I think, um, I know my family, <laughs> One of my nieces sent out the structure of these what these four kids are going to do every day, you know, and I know that she's had to modify that. But other people are going, wow, she's so organized. And I, I after you said that, Ruby, I thought, I wonder how that's going. Um, so is this something that we could do to help our communities is and in, in the bridges, um, the framework, um, social media venues that we have? Are you, have you thought about that, Ruth or R Ruby or Lynn? Can you ask that question another way? Um, so some of the, what you just said, can we share that on Facebook through right. the Bridges Out of Poverty Facebook page or another page? Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, like I think I wrote a blog about that, some things to consider for structure, and it's on there. But uh, Julia just said in the chat box that she's tried and failed to keep a structured routine. And I'm telling you what, it just doesn't work. I don't care who you are, okay? Even with one child, because you're trying to scramble and stay alive, and they're 
and then on top of that, doing your job, and then on top of that, keeping them. And then like we were talking with uh, Michelle, if you're in poverty and you have a phone and you only bought so many minutes for that phone, you're gonna be very stingy who you give those minutes to. And so it's, yeah, but we have, we should post uh, maybe ideas of places that, that people can go on virtual tours. We haven't done that, that's a great idea. Yeah, somebody said the uh, National Historical Society or something like that was doing a lot of stuff right now. Uh, I'm gonna make a note. Places for virtual tours, okay. Uh, for Regina says she got a list. Le Regina, can you send that list to us? She's not sure, okay. Oh, and a link to the blog. Ruth, can you post on the uh, uh, chat box or land that blog I wrote about what to do, structures? I think that was a blog I wrote. Yeah, yeah. thank you. So great. just so, just so you all know. I don't remember that structure one, but I will link to the blogs. And if I see the structure blog uh, specifically, then I'll put it in Ruby's Facebook page. Um, Many of you know Ruby's Facebook page. We also have Bridges Out of Poverty Facebook page, which deals more about community solutions. So sometimes we post one on one and one on not on another, and you might want to join both of those pages. Um, yesterday, there was a really good thing that we posted to the blog page, or the Bridges page, was about how to talk to your clients about spending their first check that they get from the government. Oh. <laughs> oh, I'm landscaping because I can't go anywhere so <laughs> which is a very helpful piece to um to that might work for you to share with some of your families but yeah I'll post the blog stuff right here right away thank you and I was thinking also about writing an article and I I don't have to be the one to do it but one of the things I think is that in the most <laughs> interesting thing that came out of the research, in uh, in my opinion, on New Orleans, Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina, was that the people who survived that, and it was horrible, the people who survived it were not the people with the most money. They were the people who had the most social capital. They had the most support systems, the most relationships, et cetera. So one of the things I've been doing a lot of thinking about is how do you develop and keep your social capital during this time when you're not allowed to, to be with anybody and you're not allowed to be outside. So like um, Ricky sent me a note and he's like, one thing I said that somebody asked me what, T and I were going to do tonight, my husband and I, well, we're going to go in our backyard, back driveway. We are going to put on country Western music and we're going to practice our country dancing. I mean, <laughs> I saw a thing in um, Buffalo, New York or Rochester, New York, this whole block, this whole block at 5.30 every day. They go, the block goes out and they're all socially distant, like they're all six feet away. But somebody's got a boom box and what they're doing is they're turning on their boom box and they're all dancing to the music for a half hour at 530 every day. They wave to each other on the street. I'm thinking, okay, that's a fabulous way to keep your social capital going. And uh, how you do that. Uh, I think that doesn't cost you any money. And it's, it's going to have to be critical. We Look, y'all, we have another month of this at least, okay? at least in uh jim wants to know if we'll get a video of this dancing while we're <laughs> like let me tell you how bad it is t went out th this morning my husband and he sang to the dogs you know what <laughs> and here's the thing the dogs sang back <laughs> and that's how desperate everybody is I, you know, I, I often, I, I'm pretty sure that since my kids are high school kids, although I know some are on the streets and, and homeless and stuff, I, uh, I personally, without just dumping out a sob story here, I've been up here in the White Mountains for about six years, and I've had friendships come and go, um, went through a couple right. of foot surgeries. So me personally, this whole social not, I, I'm just having a really hard time, even though I taught online at college level for 
the first four years of me being up here, um, I'm used to that, but I was able to go out and go to the senior center, for example, and play cards or go to the store and just talk to random strangers. I'm, I'm missing the, I live in a really small town in the White Mountains. I don't live on the res. I'm about 30 minutes from the res. And so this, this idea of not allowing myself as a teacher to, to fall into their panic attacks and, and myself having my own social isolation issues up here. So I don't know why I just said all that, but yeah, I think maybe somehow trying to figure out how to, I've always been the kind of teacher where I connect what I'm going through with my students. And I grew up in, on a res in, in their environment, um, but I got out, so yeah. <laughs> what, what, I, 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 think, I will hear from other people on this chat, but I'm sure um, uh, that everybody, in some way is feeling like you are. Could the rest of you comment? I don't think you're alone. Well, and I, I'm just saying, I have literally no family, no friends, no nothing up here. So uh, my kids were my family for the past year. And now that, and my coworkers, colleagues, now that's just all gone, you know? So it's. My wife says that every day I have so many words I must use. <laughs> <laughs> And so she is unfortunately the only recipient of this constant barrage of words. So she encourages <laughs> me to get on Zoom meetings and FaceTimes. <laughs> and honey, do you need to call somebody? So yes. Have you guys seen the um, the the uh, somebody sent out one of, after a meeting with my colleague colleagues yesterday? Uh, it was a, a picture it said the the future of of business meetings and it was a picture of the brady bunch mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know the brady bunch picture with the nine faces on the screen it's like <laughs> okay so we got some interesting things in the chat box jawanda says our school division has created an additional web page and regina you have leadership groups that used to meet for breakfast now you have them virtually Yes, right. And Sunil, I see you're on there. What are you doing right now? Oh, she's got her sound off. Okay. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to work Zoom so I can see you and hear you, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> but I'm Blakey. He's been. He's 12, and he's helping me. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Yeah. How is Blakey? Good? Yeah, he's doing good and he's doing, they're doing their homework together on Zoom and whatever. So he's doing good. He's get, He's got his structure and what he has to do. And How so is he structuring he gets, his day? Just out of curiosity. How, what now? How is he structuring his day? Well, Blake structures his day for him. <laughs> Are you surprised? No, but how is that day structured? <laughs> well, he has a grid and he has the subjects that he has uh, work in. And then uh, he, Blake does his work and checks off that he's done it. And, uh, and he has, he even has PE. So he has to do how many? Uh, an hour of activity. So he has an hour of activity a day. So he does, he goes out and plays Frisbee with himself and runs around with the dogs and, and then times it and comes and puts it on his, his sheet. He has a sheet. Is it, does he have to do the same thing every day at the same time or can he flex that? No, that's flexed. He does it whenever he wants to. And he's, he's doing really good. I mean, he's getting it done so that he can play video games with his friends. And that's the reward. Waiting. That's, you know, that's his reward. Yeah. Instead of waiting to the end of the day and not getting it done. Right. Right. But, um, you know, having Zoom and being able to contact your friends that way is just unbelievably helpful to kids. So 
Basically, that's kind of what he's doing. And the teachers are, um, they can text them or um, contact them for help at certain times during the day. So they're staying in contact with them. Wow, that's cool. Hey, Ruby, but, this you know, is Jawanda. Oh, Hi, Jawanda. I'm sorry. Hey. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of things that um, I'm experiencing. Um, so personally, I have a 17-year-old and a three-year-old. <laughs> and so we have some baked in um, how to navigate with each other and how to okay. communicate when you're getting on each other's nerves. <laughs> so uh, the three-year-old is, is fascinated with writing on Sissy's whiteboard and, and she's fascinated with having a legitimate excuse to play with matchbox cards. And so um, I'm encouraging that to kind of break up the monotony. Um, but in terms of her schoolwork, one of the things that um, she shared with me is that her teacher has set up a group text. Um, I think there are no more than four or five people in each group. Um, and so that's the way that they're doing the discussions because some of the students have limited minutes, but they have unlimited text. Um, so that's a way that uh, the teachers are navigating that. Um, they are also, of course, using the Zoom and the virtual platforms, but we have pickup sites um, for families that don't have access to internet. Um, and her science teacher actually sent home a Ziploc bag that has, you know, legit um, flask and some other things in it um, with just some activities that she can do and show the family. Um, one that was interesting is I had bought some um, punch, some citrus you know, fruity something punch. And she took a paper towel and swirled it in the drink with the fork to show how much food coloring was in the juice. Wow. And so cool experiment, but then, you know, of course none of us really wanted to drink much of it after that because it didn't seem so healthy. Um, but I thought that was a neat way for the teacher to kind of bring the whole family into an activity. Um, and then in the chat, I shared a link um, to our Caroline County Public Schools page. Um, and there I saw today that they posted a social and emotional learning site. And it has different articles and activities, um, for example, stress and anxiety management. Um, and they have that for students and then also for families and how to uh, look for signs of anxiety um, when explaining the coronavirus and all that's going on. So I put that in the chat um, for you guys. I will look more into what's going on there and see if we can link some of the uh, things from AHA process. Yep. And then the last thing I wanted to share was um, as part of my responsibility with being the trainer support for uh, our Bridges certified folks, this week I have hosted an 11 o'clock and 2 o'clock time out. And um, we have had a lot of fun with it. And people have just been saying this is the first time I've seen, you know, people and, you know, I'm, the walls are starting to close in and just personally I'm doing fine, but professionally I'm not. And so in that 15 minute um, call, which has been really been flowing over to about 30 minutes, I am telling the corniest jokes and the wackiest riddles that I can find just so that we can have a laugh and some of the creative answers that are coming um, out of that. And then also giving people an opportunity to share a creative strategy or a challenge that they're having in their community. And the feedback has been really positive, first of all, for folks to just laugh to do something that is not work related or family related or children related. And then to see that we're really not alone because there's so many states represented on the call. And so um, that's some of what I'm seeing and hearing. Um, and I've been pushing folks to the Zoom and pushing them to um, the Facebook pages as well, because I think that's a theme that I'm hearing. People just need to connect. Um, and if we can collaborate and share the resources, um, I think we can do it 
in this time frame like we've not been able to do it before. So um, that has been encouraging and has been filling my bucket. Um, so if I had any suggestion, I would say look at the text messages and look at um, just some flat out timeouts that are corny at best, but an opportunity to laugh. So just keep our sanity. Great idea. And Jim posted in the, thank you so much, Jawanda. And Jim posted in the chat box, he's, did, he's doing a video every day from his school. So he's been putting them, he's got a link where you can go um, check his videos out every day from his kids. Uh, and Ruben says he's getting calls for counseling online from his former students. And I told Regina, I'll write up what you do for your money. But I want to say one thing the, uh, before we go today is that, because um, we're going to cut it off at 45 minutes, but I, which is another five minutes. But uh, one of the things in the studies they did on homeless kids in uh, Las Vegas, and it's been one of the most effective strategies when you're dealing with your budget is you use a set of envelopes. So for those of you that are dealing with people who are gonna start getting this money and they don't tell them for well, their first paycheck, what are they gonna do for it? You make an envelope system and what you do is you have six envelopes and you put, it's easier if you glue them on the inside of a manila folder and just, but if you don't have that, if you just have some envelopes, and one envelope is rent or the mortgage, one envelope is food, one is utilities, one is tr transportation, uh, and then you can have a medical one or a, a whatever, but you need to have one envelope. You can have more than six, but six is what, seven is the max that's kind of manageable. And what you do then, one envelope is for extra money. And what you have to do is you have to figure out how much money do I have to put in this envelope each when I get paid to deal with my rent? So on the outside of the envelope, you put how much money you have to have a month for rent, and then you figure out how much that you have to put in there a week. So you have two numbers and you check off if you did it that week. You do that for food, you do that for uh, your other key uh, expenses. And then what you do, if you have to borrow, like for example, you're short on food money and you have to borrow from rent, you put a little note in there, I owe rent, how much money, $20. And what we teach them how to do is how to go backward. And I'll do a worksheet for you in that article, I'll write it up this afternoon. But they keep the money in envelopes and they do money backward. The so if this is how much money you have to begin with, then you start subtracting what's essential. So one is envelopes, two is the backward planning, and number three is how you rotate bills over a 90-day cycle. Most people don't know that you don't have to pay for something for 90 days before it can be taken away from you, and now you can't be evicted for at least 60. So what you do is you do a 90-day rule here, and you the bill, the bill you paid last goes on the bottom of the pile. And what you figure out is what you have to cycle out so that you can pay what is essential to stay alive. And then the last rule in poverty is you can't share your money. And the bottom line is this, if, in this way, if somebody comes to you and says, hey man, I need to borrow some money from you, what the only legitimate comment for no is to say, I have to save that money for food for my kids. And that, in that case, they'll allow you to have, keep the money. But I've got story after story after story of um, the thing about sharing money. And sh you have to say, no, I've got to keep some for my kids so they have food or my parents so they have food. So one man I know gave all his cash to the local priest so that when somebody came and asked him to borrow money, he'd say, I don't have any, just so that he would uh, have a legitimate reason not to do it. But I'll write these down, but they're how you begin to think about it. I'll just say if you came out of generational poverty, this whole idea of having a paper pencil budget does not work. 
And number two, uh, it's easier to operate off of a cash system. 30% of adults in generational poverty don't have a checking account or a bank account. So you want to, it's a cash-based society a lot. So one of the things is that you work with that. The last point I'll make is this, whenever you get to survival around the world, people start bartering and it's already started. There's a lot of bartering online. And so the issue is for your bartering, do you know how to barter? So I, I will put, cause you can, sh if you're gonna share, then I recommend that you barter uh, as well. That, so, Ruby, that was uh, fantastic information. The one thing I wanted to say at the, you know, at the end of this is um, our own mental health. Um, my son, he now teaches at the Air Force Academy and he's lost two of his uh, cadets that committed suicide. People are really having a difficult time. So in the chat, I also put a couple of virtual tours. The entire list that I have uh, came from a, a college and I asked if I could share it and they said no. Uh, you know, even though it's public information. So I just copied and pasted a few out of that. Take some tours. I love that we're going to be doing these weekly meetings because this will also help with that mental health. So thank you. And maybe that's the topic next time, uh, mental health issues, because um, I'm really worried about that. Yeah. Not just the suicides, but the... Um, trauma, the abuse, the violence, uh, it's going to be there. All righty, y'all, thank you for joining us. Thank um, you. This is Ruth. Um, we would, I, I work with Ruby and do a lot of social media, and we would love for this uh, forum to grow. So please invite your friends next week if they can. And if you would uh, drop into the chat one of the things that was most powerful for you today, um, and allow me to use that in future um, discussions of talking about that. I would enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm definitely going to share it with my co, -co colleagues, my <laughs> other teachers. Yeah. Uh, and you know what? It, thank you for all of you who joined today. It, we're all isolated, so it's wonderful <laughs> to hear from everybody. Anyway. It was amazing to play around with Zoom and just scroll through all the faces. It's like, oh, look at all these people. <laughs> <laughs> it was all good right. to see you. It yeah. is good, yeah. All, all right. right. See you, everybody. I got to go home right. school now. <laughs> right. I got to go get my lesson Bye -bye. plans together for next week. <laughs> all right. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.